to read the title and then go from there. The title is um, uh, Safely Streamlining Healthcare Policy Management Using Ideas from Structured Natural Water Processing. And I'm Asif, and as uh, my colleague Sergio here, and with uh, we're a company called Collective Health. So, Collective Health is a company that provides a platform for employers to offer healthcare to the workforce. Um, and what that means is that we, we, have a, we have a couple of different parts of the platform. And one thing you can see in the, in the upper image is, in, or the, is the, there's a, um, a cell phone app and there's a, some portals that are used for the people who are in um, the workforce to find and get care, get their medical cards, um, and basically manage all the parts of their um, health uh, insurance plan. Um, there's also a separate um, website that's used by the employers, and you can see at the bottom there's um, an example of the kind of benefits uh, page that would explain to somebody who's got a medical plan what their benefits are. In this case, it's a maternity benefit, so somebody who's pregnant would need to know what kind of care they get from preventative care and so forth. Um, there's also a, a fairly large back end to the whole business where we process all the medical claims, all the dental vision pharmacy claims, and we also handle um, phone support and so forth for everybody. So um, the objective of the company is to provide a better member experience and um, using kind of data. And we've had some pretty good success. We've been in business for a few years. Um, we launched our major platform in 2016, and this is our third year of operations. We've got 20,000 people in the plan. Um, we've been able to show that the medical trends are, have been uh, pretty flat, and we've had, had really big response from our uh, members in terms of customer support. So the basis of the whole thing is really this idea of a health plan. And the, the subject of the talk is to talk about sort of the guts of how these plans come about and how to manage them and streamline the management of them. Um, and so the first question is, what is a health plan? A health plan is a, is a fairly complicated thing. Basically, there's all these, you know, many, many detailed hypothetical situations of uh, medical situations of different types of um, uh, you know, services that would come up in terms of getting preventative care, like flu shock, or actually if you say you broke your leg, or you get a heavy heart disease like um, diabetes or whatever. There's lots and lots of different conditions there. Um, and then there's also many, many different hypothetical states that a person can be in. They can um, have just you know, had what's called a, a, a basically a qualifying event. Let's say they just got married, and that means they can change their plan. They can, they can be open enrollment, in which case they, uh, you know, sign up for a plan, or they can be mid-year. They can actually have, um, uh, you know, be different parts of their deductible. And so the question is, who pays why and under what conditions? And there's lots and lots of pages of text that are governing these agreements. And so I have a plot here of the different um, sizes of healthcare documents. And so this is a long plot on the y-axis, and you can see that uh, these are all different types of documents that are involved with one of our health plans. Um, the first five rows are basically different types of documents that are inside the health plan, um, with a total of about 150 pages of text that are you know, required to define the health plan. Um, and so as a comparison, that's about, you know, maybe uh, one third the size of the novel Dr. Zhivago, right? So it's a huge amount of text that's required to define the health plan. And we actually serve lots and lots of health plans um, because we have you know, a number of customers, each of which has many plans, so we have about 10,000 pages of text total. Um, and so in the, that text document, there's actually a lot of different considerations. There's administrative uh, considerations, financial, legal, and ethical uh, considerations are all required to, um, to be there in the plan. And there's lots of dialects of, you know, formal dialects of you know, legalese and, and other areas that are, um, that are important to kind of consider. So, you know, it, it's actually a very mental process, right? And so, how do we streamline it? We want to, you know, we're a data science team, we want to actually figure out how to streamline this. And so what we want is we want to have C3PO, because C3PO, first of all, is a diplomat, and also, uh, he knows many, many, many languages, so there's maybe, you say, 32,000 dialects of healthcare that C3PO can help, let's say, the lawyers talk to the policymakers, talk to the administrative people, and so forth. So, okay, well, we don't have C3PO, but what do we have? We have lots of text, and we have some ideas around process automation, so there's, Business process automation, and there's like a more recent idea called robotic process automation, where you basically build 
you know, macros and, and, and scripts to help thread together different tools that are used in processing. Um, and so what we're, the subject of this talk is to introduce ideas from language processing to enhance this whole procedure and make, you know, get us to an intelligent version of process automation that understands what it's doing. Um, and therefore can do lots more than, than uh, some of the other versions. Okay, so one of the key ideas here is that as we add more and more automation to the system, we want things to be safe. Um, and, um, and so in a way of thinking about how to make things safe, we went to sort of look at how to, what's the processes around building nuclear power plants, right? And so um, in those types of situations, document curation is actually a really big deal. And so here, you know, they have um, design requirements and license requirements, which are in terms of what's required to be there to make sure that the nuclear uh, facility is safe. And those are, have to be communicated to both the design process and the databases associated with building the plant and actually also implementation of actually building the plant. And all those three things have to be kind of uh, conforming, right? And so, um, in other words, if you actually thought you were building one thing, but you built a different thing, it can be pretty dangerous in this, this uh, machine. So how do we apply that to healthcare? Well, you know, so adding semantics into the system allows us to build tools that combine automation and safety in, in policy management. And so what do we mean by safety? There's four things. First of all, we want to have peer review and approval of updates. We want to have the ability to track and recover anything that was done in these plans by who did it and the date that they did it. Um, we want to have checking and verification of, of, the, of all these things. Um, and we want to be resilient to human error. Okay, so that, those are the four kind of uh, pillars of, of safety. And when you have um, uh, kind of areas where the health plan is defined differently in different places, you can have a lot of miscommunication, actually a lot of headaches in terms of people thought they were going to be covered in an operation, maybe they weren't or whatever, and that's actually a big deal. So we want to avoid that. And so, the, so I'm going to kind of talk about how we thought about bringing the ideas of, of natural language and, and, and language processing into this. Um, so you can see this is a, um, first I have the page for our website that defines the maternity benefits, which is kind of a way of describing um, somebody's, uh, what, you know, what, what somebody's policy is. In, in this case, um, if somebody's pregnant, preventative care is actually free if um, it's in an in-network case and it's not covered out of network. So uh, the natural language version of this is for preventative care, maternity benefits, in-network visits have a zero dollar copay, and out-of-network visits are not covered. And so there's some keywords in there, preventative care, maternity, zero dollar copay, and not covered. And then there's some context that's very healthcare specific. So Probably most of you who have health insurance know what in-network is and what out-of-network is. In-network means that your um, insurance provider has a relationship with that doctor, therefore you get a certain rate. Out-of-network means that there isn't, and so you wouldn't. So, so there's a big difference if you go to a doctor that's out-of-network and you, know, you might have to pay for it yourself rather than having your employer pay for it. So, you know, that, that text right there is already kind of something that not everybody wants to read every day, right? So the way that we um, started looking at, uh, you know, making it more manageable for the people who are dealing with in the back office, and this is also very important in the practices that they have, is this idea of a tabular structure of natural language. And so what that means is that the parsing of the language is actually done graphically, but when you're sort of setting it up into different um, categories. So here there's uh, a code, a category, service type, and then different conditions in terms of in and out of network coverage. And so those keywords that I boxed on the top each map to one of these um, columns on the bottom. And you can go back and forth. It's a little bit lossy if you go from the, te um, the natural language to the tabular natural language. But in, in effect, you can actually go back and forth between these two different types of language. Um, and then moving on to structured language, which is so probably something that you, most of you are more, more familiar with, you can take something like this tabular natural language and then with um, a transformation turn it into a serialized object, in this case a JSON object. So all the same information that was in the tabular structured language can get put into the JSON object and then it's all there that can be used in programming um, to, to just deserialize it to an object. Um, so that's the guts of the three kind of components uh, of, of ways that the information is stored and I've sort of Put it into a diagram, 
and you can see the red blocks of those three blocks. There's the structured language at the bottom, there's the structured, uh, there's the, the natural language in the middle, which is the tabular structure language, and then there's natural language, which is the, the red block at the top. And then, so those are the three categories. And now, I can talk, you know, those arrows, which are, have some missing pieces in their document. So there's three kind of key ideas in the language processing area that I want to describe. First is parsing, which I guess many people have heard of, but then basically that means you're reading and um, constructing objects. Right? And then the, there's another idea called lexing, which is kind of a subset of parsing, which tokenizes words in, 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 a, in a string. Right? And the third thing is rendering, which is actually you know, basically displaying the final content. So going from the structured language to the tabular um, uh, version requires a parser. So it's, it's actually going to sort of deserialize the, 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 um, the object from that JSON structure. And it's going to kind of map it into this, um, this, uh, this, this tabular structure. And, the, and it needs some context to do that. And the context is called what in our case we call a mask, which is like the mask layout for, uh, for the tabular structure. And then there's a second operation taking it to the natural language where it's already the words are already kind of set out, so the parsing, you don't have to take it out of the object, but you have to pick those words and put them into place. And that's what's called lexing. So we're going to use a natural language template to actually take those words, put them into the sentence that I described, and that's lexing. And then once you have that sentence, you can render it in different ways using a style sheet. So this is, that's kind of like the most abstract kind of idea here, but this is sort of the, the model for how we use language um, that solves the problem. So, so I just want to, before I move over into the implementation side, talk about, well, you know, this is kind of a, maybe a little attract to what, you know, why would we do this, right? And so the idea here is the safety thing is really relevant in, in, um, in when we start applying the data science ideas to, to, to policy and healthcare. And so this is an article that came out um, actually just um, last month, actually. Um, in the Verge, and the article is kind of annoying. It said, okay, what happens when an algorithm cuts your healthcare? I think most of us here write algorithms every day, you know, sort of the more than one type of algorithm. This happened to be a black box algorithm, policy optimization algorithm that was installed in, um, that the state of Missouri was using to kind of optimize their health plans. What it wound up doing was basically cutting the health, cutting some limits on the, the, the allowable healthcare for somebody with cerebral palsy. Which wasn't intended, but just you know, what happened, and they didn't catch up, and then the person actually wanted to get service, and they, but they weren't allowed to get service, and it was basically unfair. Um, and it made the news. So then, well, we want to change it, change it around. We want to make it so that we want to make it so the algorithms actually protect you from having your policy cut. And, you know, if you build semantics in the system and you build kind of verification, that's exactly what you should. So I want to kind of hand it over to my colleague Sergio to talk about. So yeah, so as I just mentioned, uh, basically what we have is a big collection of uh, can you me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, a big collection of uh, healthcare policy data that is extremely critical for, for, for our business and also for them for the people that we cover, right? And the idea is what we wanted to build a system, uh, a policy management system that not only check the right checkboxes in terms of safety, reliability, and expressivity, but we also wanted to make the system uh, friendly for our subject matter experts. We wanted something that was usable. So on one hand, we have you know this very ambitious goal. Hey, we want a system uh, to which you can describe the health insurance plan that you want, and somehow the system administers the plan fully automatically and doesn't make any errors. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have the subject, matter, the subject matter experts that already know how this health insurance plan should work, right? So from that perspective, it makes sense to have high bandwidth interface between these two entities, right? You, you don't want to put friction in the process of ingesting uh, expert knowledge into your system. Uh, so that, that's, that's basically uh, one of the most important things we, we're trying to do here. Uh, and as I mentioned, the approach that we're trying to, to, to take here for, to, to reach this ultimate goal is not that, hey, we're going to somehow train a model with a bunch of examples, and somehow the model is going to perfectly understand uh, all these policies, but rather we, we want to build a system that will act as an a intellectual amplifier of sorts for our subject matter experts. So I guess the main point I'm trying to make here is uh, usability was extremely important because we, we wanted to ingest the, the expert knowledge into the system. 
Uh, so from this user first perspective, uh, and with our goals in mind, we, we need to answer four questions. Right? First, how are, how are our experts going to enter uh, data into the system? Uh, you know, how easy or how hard is it going to be? And what types of data can they enter into, into the system? Uh, second, once the data has been entered into the front end, how do we ingest it? How do we massage it in, 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 into a format that we can do useful things with? Uh, third, uh, we, we knew that hey, if we, we want to have quality control and safety checks around this data, we need some sort of version control system. So how are people going to interact with the version control system? And finally, finally how, how is the peer review process going to work? Uh, how, how is that workflow going to look like uh, from end to end? Um, and then the, the final thing I want to point out is since usability was uh, one of our main goals, uh, usability is not something that you can just sit down and analyze and prove, right? The way to, to verify if your system is usable or not is you need to put something in front of people and see if, if they actually can learn how to use it and use it successfully to accomplish their goals. So we, we wanted to build an MVP, put something in front of people as fast as we can and learn if, if if this is something that people can, again, can use to, to administer uh, or to enter all this data. Cool, so I'm gonna, the, the, the next section talks uh, is gonna be about, around these four questions. So number one, well, how do we uh, capture data? And we found that for our MVP, Google Sheets was a great place to start. Uh, it has a great, uh, very well-documented API. It's, it's reasonably fast. Uh, pretty much every single one of our subject matter experts uses a spreadsheet for a spreadsheet uh, program at least once a day. Uh, and we found that tables of data are actually extremely intuitive for, for non-technical folks. And they're also pretty dense. So, you know, they, 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 it has a nice combination of um, having a, a, a nice information density. Uh, we're necessarily getting confusing. Uh, and then finally, with, with you know, we, we knew that the starting point would be a, a tablet representation. Uh, with Bullchips, we cannot build the most usable interface, but uh, it has some features that come from free. Uh, for example, cell coloring, drop downs, validation, and so on, that uh, we thought could get us uh, pretty far in terms of, of usability. Uh, next, okay, so now we have this data in a tabular format. That's what the left hand side uh, image that is trying to show. So how do we uh, serialize that? How, how do we ingest that? And the idea is, well, if you think about what a spreadsheet is, it's just a grid of values, right? And each, each cell in this grid has a coordinate associated with it. So what you want is you, you want to map the coordinate of each cell to the path in the final serialized uh, object, right? So that's the idea there. So, so that's the purpose of the mask. And one of the nice things about the mask is that it lets you go back and forth with this. You know, with the map, you can go in both directions. And what we found is that if our mask uh, follow the, the grid structure of the input form, uh, our subject matter experts could actually maintain the mask by themselves with just a little bit of training. And what we did on our end, to make, uh, we, we built code to make sure the JSON was still compatible with the mask, the front end was still compatible with the mask. But uh, all in all, let's say our experts wanted to, to capture a, a new type of data about plants. Uh, it was very easy for them to just, hey, I'm going to add a new table here in this part of the UI, uh, and I'm going to tweak the mask a little bit. And then if they get right, the, 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 the framework will tell them, okay, I, I, I understand what you mean. I know how to ingest this data, and it's all good. And if, if they forgot something, the, the framework will flag, will, will flag that. Cool. Uh, now, the next thing is version control. So I guess the main question, or the, the, the main problem we had, or the main question we tried to answer early on is, well, should we build our own solution or should we use an existing off-the-shelf uh, version control system? And I'm sure you guys are, are familiar with all these open source version control systems. You know, they're actually powerful and reliable, but they're also very complicated, right? Uh, here I'm showing uh, the Git data model with all the push and the pulls and the commits and, and so on, and all the branches and the merging and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, that, that was really a challenge from, uh, if, if we decide to go down that path. Uh, on the other hand, we, uh, we also discovered that if you want to build a distributed version control system that enables many people to edit data at the same time, it's actually pretty hard. There, there's not that many shortcuts you can take to build that. So our solution was to take Git and to, and to um, wrap it in an interface that's, uh, that, that is accessible for our end users. So basically, we, we were able to condense all of the complexity in Git into four commands. So initialize, that's the 
That's a command that will create a dev branch and switch to that branch. Edit is the thing that will take the data from the Git branch into the UI. Uh, request review will take the data from the UI, check it into the dev branch, sync your dev branch with master and check for conflicts, and then create a pull request. And then finally, cleanup command will just uh, delete the, the local copy of the repo, and, and it will uh, delete your branch. So that's version control. So, so yeah, so I guess just to reiterate, so um, in our company, we use GitHub. That's just the version control solution we use. So we say, okay, for this MVP, we're going to use GitHub to, as a version control backend. Uh, for the editing front end, they said, well, that's just good shit. And then for the Gnome logic, uh, we found that Python was a pretty good solution. Uh, it already has libraries for, uh, to talk with these APIs. And you know, it's pretty well understood in, in our company. So that's, uh, that's basically the core of the implementation. It's just the Python group logic that connects these two systems. And I have a screenshot there of what the actual tool looks like. So uh, the way the, the, the framework works is, hey, if I want to make a change, let's say I want to make a change to plan A of, plan of, of client X, first thing I do is I go and double click the initialize command there at the top, then I navigate to client X, then plan A, and then I double click edit from there, and then finally, when I'm done making my changes, maybe, maybe I change other plans or whatever, at the end of the day, I just go and, and do the, uh, from the request review command when I'm done. And we'll, we'll have a demo of that uh, in, a, in a few moments. Now, the, um, the other thing is I, I want to talk about before the demo is, well, how does the peer review process work? Uh, so we found that GitHub actually you know, was like a, a pretty good foundation for the MVP. So first of all, the, the pull request you is a very nice way for people to communicate, to, to exchange messages between each, uh, among each other about a particular change. So you can, you know, add a comment to entire pull review, pull, pull request, or you can also add comments in line in a particular piece of data, like, hey, what about this? Oh, did you forget about this? Uh, the other uh, thing that we got for free was the diff view on GitHub. Uh, so we found that, you know, uh, if we made our serialized format understandable, uh, we were able to just uh, present people the, the Git diff view and they understand what's going on. So people are not, our users are not expected to directly touch or directly edit the serialized data, but it's still understandable, and that's how we were able to, 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 to just use the, the, the GitHub diff for our purposes. And finally, the other thing that's pretty easy to do from GitHub is, you know, hey, I, let's say you merge the wrong change or you, you realize, hey, I made a mistake. Uh, it's very easy to roll back the mistake. It's also very easy to understand, well, uh, you know, when was this error introduced? And then finally, maybe you want to understand the context, like who made it, who, who introduced the error, who was the reviewer, and so on. So, you know, you can do rollbacks, you can use the, the blank feature. Uh, so what's next is a, a little demo of, the, uh, of this framework. And basically, the stage is we have a repo with our policy data. So that's it. It has only the master branch. And let's say I want to make a change. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go and run the initialize command. Uh, so that behind the scenes is creating a clone uh, to, my phone, to my laptop. You can see that. That's cloning the repo. And it's creating a branch. So if I refresh that, now there's a branch. has my username. has a timestamp. It's all happening behind the scenes. Uh, then let's say I want to uh, edit this object called SPD. So I just go into the object, double click the edit command, and I'm going to be presented with a, with a UI to make the edits. So let's say that's the object, it's a table, has all sorts of sentences about uh, health insurance policies. And let's say, oh, what I want to do is I just want to restrict the fertility medications. So I just copy the value from one side to another. That's the, that's the extent of my changes. So I just go uh, do. I run the request review command. This is checking my changes into my dev branch, uh, syncing master with my dev, and then it's bringing up the pull request uh, via GitHub. I briefly describe what my change is about, and then the, the tool also copies uh, a helpful review message to, to the clipboard, so I just paste it, and I have the URLs in case people want to see the full context of my changes. And then I just click the green pull request button, and then the reviewer comes in, and then gets the email, and they say, okay, what do you change? And it's right there. That's the diff right there. Like, okay, I can see, like, uh, is it restricted? Just change to, to, you know, open to is restricted. And then here against the reviewer, you're saying, okay, I, I, I approve of these changes. So it's just writing, okay, uh, acceptance message, and then it's uh, merging uh, the changes. 
So at this point, my branch has been merged. If I go back to the, to the branch view uh, on GitHub, you will see that it says, OK, yeah, this branch has been merged. And then the editor says, OK, I'm done. I'm going to run the cleanup command. Uh, and I, this is going to delete my local copy of the, of the repo. And it's also deleting my, deleting my branch. So it's gone. And now we are back to step one, and the source of truth has been updated. So that's, that's the demo. Um, so I said, I just want to um, highlight, OK, so this is something we need build, and we put in users' hands. So what was the impact? Uh, we found that, you know, like that thing you saw was sufficient for production use for our scale uh, this year. So uh, down here, I have the, uh, the, the utilization data for the tool. Uh, we were seeing about 200, we, we saw around 250 pull requests in four months. That's about three pull requests per day. Uh, per weekday. So every day that people came into the office, our policy experts came into the office, uh, we saw three pull requests coming from the team, and that totals up about uh, 400,000 data points. And since, you know, since these things seem to be pretty well received, uh, we're actually able to just strip out all the plan data, all, all the specific logic of our plan data, and just turn it into a generalized uh, library to, to control different types of uh, business rules and, uh, and other types of policy information. Uh, so what did we learn? Uh, number one, that you know, most uh, version control or version con control concepts are actually foreign to most non-programmers. Right? Like the, they're not familiar with the, the idea of a, of a dev branch, of a pull request, and all, and all that. So it was extremely important to very early on explain uh, how version control works and to introduce concepts that uh, the concepts in a way that, that, that our users would understand. Uh, so, for example, we use the term working copy. We didn't talk about branches and pools and whatever. Say, so, hey, there's a working copy. That's your little sandbox where you stage your changes. And then when you're done, you just request a review. And we found that people already knew what that diff was, so we used the term diff. Um, and so, so, yeah, that was very important to, to, to get clear early on. Uh, the other thing we, we learned is that um, it was actually the tool, the frame was pretty well received by our users. Uh, so it, it didn't necessarily create a, a huge, uh, or it didn't necessarily constitute a huge deviation from the workflows that they're, they're, they were used to, just double click this, double click that, double click that when you're done. And also, we found that people really understood what was the point of this, right? Like the, the, comment, the comments that we, what, that we heard, it's like, well, I can't believe we ever live without this. Uh, you know, it, it, didn't, it didn't take long for them to internalize why this type of safe, uh, workflow made sense to, to handle this type of data. Um, then finally, the other thing we, we observed is that uh, merge conflicts were pretty rare in our case, and that has to do on part because of the way we, we manage plan data, is that usually one person uh, managing a single plan, uh, and also the way we structure the plans in the repo, where one plan is several dozen files, so you will only get a merge conflict in, uh, in the case that uh, two people touch the same uh, uh, part of the plan at the same time, uh, and we only actually run into two of those cases, and we found that for our MVP, we need to build uh, a robust and friendly merge conflict resolution. Um, so conclusion, so what, uh, I guess, yeah, I just want to kind of look back to the, the, the concept that as as if introduced, and the idea like, well, you know, in, 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 in healthcare, and our, um, there's this notion of a robotic, robotic process automation, right? That, that's the state of the art. Everybody wants to, you know, uh, automate uh, the, administ the administrative side of healthcare, uh, and you know, there are like certain trends there. Uh, we don't think we can take the, this kind of language processing approach and really take this uh, uh, take automation to the next level. And and I do think we're actually pretty close to to where this can become a reality. It, and if you think about this. Let's just think about the table where we describe what a health insurance plan is, or what exactly what plan do I want. If you think about one particular cell in that table, there's a very well-defined context around, the, 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 around that cell, right? There's only a handful of messages that make sense to enter in that cell, right? I'm not going to write like a, a letter from my grandmother, I'm not going to you know, set a meeting with a colleague, or say thanks, or whatever. There's like a very precise context that means you know, that there's only a handful of messages that make sense, and that simplifies the, the language processing part. Uh, the other thing that we found is like we, we don't think this is uh, an approach that can be extensible. You know, it's very easy for us to hook validation, recommendations, automatic testing um, into the system. And yeah, we, in general, we found like, okay, this, 
this is a good software pattern to, to go with into the future. And finally, it is true that you know, we're adding all of these extra uh, steps and parsing and, and understanding of what's going on there. Uh, so you know, the, the, the system for sure got more complicated, but we think we didn't necessarily make it more brittle uh, because we're able to add uh, error checking validation and transparency. So essentially, it's not a black box. Uh, it's just storing the data in, in a way that makes sense uh, to our subject matter experts. Cool. And that's, that's all I have. Thank you. When I first showed the title of this talk, I was excited because we have a bajillion different versions of contracts that we signed with folks. And I was like, oh my god, if only we could use natural language processing to interpret these contracts instead of having people's eyeballs on them, and having to read legalese, and wanting to cry. Um, and so, uh, yeah, what was the timeline? Like how, how long did it take you to hone this process? And, um, yeah. What's yeah, so, well, it, it was, um, I think it, it was just, this whole thing probably took place in a number of steps over maybe a year and a half, let's say. Um, and, that's, and then the, the part that with the demo that you saw was, was pretty quick. 